working on the content of the typology itself, and another one uh, which will be working and thinking more about how it can be used and all the connections that can be done to, to broaden its, uh, its uh, scope and impact. We will have a break uh, in the middle at 9.30 in, in case you need to get more, some coffee before the workshop starts. And at the end of the workshop, we'll be regrouping and sharing uh, the feedback together. So again, welcome and thanks for joining. And I would suggest now that uh, I will invite uh, Rick de Vries uh, to say a few words about the Clearinghouse project. And I will just introduce you, Rick, in a few words. So Rick is the team leader of the urban forestry team at the Resilience Program at EFI, the European Forest Institute. He teaches landscape ecology at Ghent University, and he's to decision making and urban planning. So on to you, Rick. I forgot to mention that um, in case you have any questions or remarks, you're more than uh, invited to, um, to add them in the chat, uh, which you can see on the, on the right side. And we'll be collecting all of the questions and uh, having a, a Q&A session at the end of the presentations. Uh, Rick, I think you're muted. Yes, we cannot hear you. <laughs> Thank you, sorry. Um, you would think after one and a half year working with these tools, we would, should know how to use them. Anyway, good morning all, good afternoon in China. And a very special welcome to our uh, colleagues and um, other partners from China, because today it's, uh, well, the whole week is, uh, is a holiday week in China, so we are very uh, thankful that you are participating in our uh, workshop today. Um, so, um, why are we stressing this uh, participation of the Chinese uh, participants? Because this is a Sino-European uh, collaboration project between uh, Europe and China, the European Union and, uh, and China. Um, so, we are working on urban forests as nature-based solutions. Urban forests are not a new uh, thing of course uh, already the Egyptian the ancient Egyptians were using trees and the Romans were using trees and forests as as a solution to to environmental challenges where they were uh, confronted with for instance to provide uh, shade in the cities or, or to provide uh, fruit uh, and other food in 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 and around the cities uh, today in in our society today we have uh, the same, but also new challenges, including uh, climate change uh, and so on. So this project is looking into how we can use trees and forests as really providers of solutions to this, this all these challenges we have uh, in, in the urban context. Um, so the project is funded by the European Union's Horizon 2020 program uh, and receive, is receiving funding from the Chinese Ministry of Science and Technology, the MOST, and the Chinese, Acad the Chinese Academy of Forestry and the National Forest and Grassland Administration in uh, China. We have uh, five case study cities in Europe and five case study cities in China. We are uh, grateful to collaborate with to to implement uh, our research um, in the field, but also to build on the challenges and experiences these cities and city regions have. So what we will do is uh, to increase the evidence on benefits of restored uh, tree-based urban ecosystems. Uh, we have been mapping urban forests uh, uh, throughout Europe and China, uh, how they are used, and we have also been surveying the societal, societal perceptions and demands in Europe and China. Um, we are now in the process of uh, preparing or starting a comparative case study analysis in, in these 10 cities um, and between the cities in Europe and China, but also within China and uh, Europe. Policy frameworks are very important for, uh, for uh, from forest and trees. Uh, so we are also looking how these policy frameworks are organized in the case study cities, but also beyond them. And we are also developing, uh, well, on the one hand, analyzing existing business and investment cases and also trying to develop new and innovative business and investment cases for urban forests as nature-based solutions. 
Uh, this workshop is part of the collaborative approach in Clearinghouse. Um, we have had uh, workshops in, in all the case of these cities at the local level. We have had workshops also on, a, on between Europe and China. Um, and this is another workshop uh, where we want to present to you on the first hand the, the typology developed, but also want, definitely want to discuss with you the typology that we have been developing. And finally, we are all also, of course, looking forward to the, the different, uh, uh, more concrete outputs of the project, which, which will be coming up in 2022 and 2023. For instance, uh, we have guide, we'll have guidelines for cost-effective urban ecosystem restoration. There will be a benchmarking tool where cities can compare how they are doing in a quite simple way and an online application uh, for different scenarios based on urban trees. How can you use uh, urban trees to uh, to provide benefits for your city or town? And finally, not mentioned here on the on the slide, um, we have also have a very interesting uh, inspirational package for students and teachers, uh, students between 10 and 14 years old, um, which is now ready uh, in English and will be soon be published in uh, Mandarin, Polish, Italian, um, Dutch and Spanish. So I invite you to have a look at uh, our website of uh, keep an eye on our social media channels which are uh, mentioned here. So uh, with this I would like to thank of course the funders of the project but also our 26 partners we have all around Europe and China for their very hard work they have been doing in, in conditions which were a bit challenging the last one and a half year and uh, of course I will also I would also like to thank all the participants to the workshop and I'm wishing you a very fruitful uh, workshop. Thank you. Thank you very much Rick. So is there and do you have any question? I haven't seen any in the chat uh, but if you do have any question at this stage uh, about the Clearinghouse project feel free if you if they come later on you can also post them in the chat and we'll address them uh, at the end of the Q&A session. Great. So before I give the floor to Manuel, first of all, I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> so just in a, in a couple of words, I'm Joanne Chante. I work for LGI Sustainable Innovation. We're one of the partners of the Clearinghouse Project. And myself, I'm in charge of innovation strategy in our um, consultancy, which works on more than 30 European projects at any given time. And in particular, uh, I'm focused on the nature-based solutions and uh, UFNBS. Uh, so thanks again, Rick. Uh, I'd like now to introduce um, Manuel Wolf, uh, who will be presenting the, um, the typology that we've been working on. Uh, so just a few words. Um, sorry, not Manuel. Sebastian. <laughs> Manuel, welcome later for the for for the session. So Sebastian, um, Sebastian Chayer is a postdoctoral researcher at the Landscape Ecology Lab at Humboldt University um, of Berlin. His research focuses on natural hazard risks, environmental justice, and nature-based solutions for climate change adaptation, and the improvement of quality of life and human health and well-being in cities, with a methodolo methodological emphasis on data science, modeling, and knowledge management. So Sebastian, I give you the floor to, to introduce the, the typology. And again, I invite uh, all the participants to add any questions you may have in the chat that we can address uh, at the end in a little Q&A session. Well, thank you, uh, Joanne, for the introduction. So in the next, well, about 30 minutes, I want to introduce you into uh, the approach and the concept that we followed when we uh, implemented this typology on urban forests as nature-based solutions. And I want to uh, start or set out from uh, the mission statement, so to say from Clearinghouse, um, that says that urban forests as nature-based solutions, UFNBS, are considered a subset of nature-based solutions that generally comprise tree-based green infrastructure. And uh, Clearinghouse considers these youth NBS important tools to make cities more resilient, more livable, to facilitate sustainable urban development, 
Um, as Rick mentioned, because of the proven benefits of the positive impacts that trees have in our cities. And uh, Joanne was uh, mentioning already the objectives. Uh, so uh, just briefly, what we intend to do with this typology is to first provide a uh, well standardized Xeno-European perspective on uh, EU of NBS. And uh, we want to establish that by considering the many different um, voices, for example, in workshops, uh, but we also want to take inspiration from existing, existing typologies, such as Green Surge or Nature for Cities. Um, as part of Clearinghouse, we have also conducted a literature review and findings are also considered. And you can uh, also access these findings at review.clearinghouseproject.eu. And um, the typology in the end should provide grounding knowledge which needs to be developed in Clearinghouse. Just a side comment, if everybody can keep their mic turned off, that would be great. We hear a little bit of background noise. Thank you. Okay. So also when we uh, want to talk about urban forces nature-based solutions, I just want to briefly also um, describe what we consider as nature-based solutions. And I've uh, copy pasted here um, two, well, I suppose well-known uh, definitions of NBS, the upper one from the European Commission, the lower one from IUCN. And these state that um, nature-based solutions um, are solutions that are inspired and supported by nature. They are said to be cost-effective, and to simultaneously provide environmental, social, and economic benefits uh, to build resilience and to bring uh, more and more diverse nature into cities. Um, looking at the uh, definition by IACN, they uh, state that NBS are actions to protect, sustainably manage, restore natural modified ecosystems to address various challenges. And also here to simultaneously provide human well-being and biodiversity benefits. So concluding from these two definitions, what we can already take away is that we should consider nature-based solutions as multifunctional entities. So as things that deliver a range of ecosystem services. However, when we look in the literature, uh, we also find that nature-based solution might be something like an umbrella term that evolved uh, through many different concepts and that touches upon uh, well, neighboring concepts. For example, when we reflect on the notion of NBS's action, uh, we may also refer to um, concepts such as ecological restoration or ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction. When we think about the benefits provided by NBS, um, we touch upon the concept of ecosystem services. Um, already the mission statement of Clearinghouse said that um, your UFNBS are elements of the green infrastructure. So the green blue infrastructure concept is of relevance and obviously also um, forestry for our case. And the latter two concepts, I want to define those uh, because we will need them later. So what do we consider as urban forest? We can conceptualize urban forest. When we look in the literature, we find a lot of definitions as the entirety of trees in a given area. So the urban forest defines, uh, comprises all trees in a city, for example. And this includes many different, well, types of green spaces, for example, city parks with trees, that includes forests, gardens with trees, trees on streets or public squares, or possibly even rooftops with trees. Um, you know, many of these, uh, well, types of green spaces, they are often uh, discussed in other typologies and as previously mentioned, could be referred to as elements of the green blue infrastructure. So when we uh, define green blue infrastructure, uh, this should be understood here as all natural or semi-natural landscape elements that could potentially form a green-blue network. And also reflecting on these definitions, uh, we can take away certain things. 
And I want to make two propositions for designing the U of NBS typology. First, when I've said urban forest is city parks with trees or streets with trees, what we can infer is that we may conceptualize U of NBS as compositions of things. Compositions will be key. And we can also take into consideration other aspects, such as uh, spatial context to describe U of NBS. And why we want to do that and why this is important, um, that's the second proposition. Uh, it's well established when we look in the literature that, for example, composition, but also landscape and urban patterns, spatial contexts, urban morphology, affect ecological functions and thereby ecosystem service delivery. And so in order to um, guide or facilitate the assessment of impacts of U of NBS, we want to focus on these aspects. And maybe this example also um, visualizes why it's important to look at composition. On the left and on the right, it's basically the same entity. It's um, a green word, but it might be immediately obvious that this example here on the left is not of relevance when we would talk about urban forest nature-based solutions. However, when uh, we understand the urban forest as anything with tree, so to say, then it becomes clear that this might be of relevance for our typology. So composition is key. And also when we reflect on the services delivered, uh, those might be different here or might have another uh, magnitude that is delivered. And what is here um, exemplified at a very local scale, when we zoom out, um, we find this diversity in compositions and contexts also when we look at other types of elements, for example, squares with streets, we have a park here and you see this quite idyllic, it's next to a river. And here we have a park that's embedded in built up land and infrastructure. So um, spatial context may, may worry and compositions may worry. And this is uh, what we want to depict in the U of NBS typology, all this variety. So um, to design the typology we propose to follow what we call a traits-based approach. Traits uh, could be understood as form, as composition, as spatial context, spatial arrangements or topological relationships. Traits could be functional, but also institutional characteristics such as institutional accessibility. And we want to apply this traits-based approach uh, to conceptualize U of NBS both in terms of spatial entities and in terms of actions. And the way we want to do this methodologically is through what is called semantic modeling. Semantic modeling is the process to structure knowledge, information, and data. And it's structured by describing relationships, relationships between entities, relationships between things, therefore. And these relationships is what is called their semantics. And to facilitate this semantic modeling process, we want to propose to use an ontology as what is called a knowledge management system. A common knowledge management system that you know from other typologies is text. In the U of NBS typology, however, we don't want to use text, but an ontology to implement our knowledge. And why we want to do that is that ontologies are very formal descriptions of knowledge. In fact, ontologies could be understood as a series of statements of facts. So things that are true about something. In our case, things that hold true when we look at certain U of NBS. And in the end, what an ontology provides is a vocabulary of terms. In our case, a vocabulary of terms to describe different types of U of NBS by describing their composition or by describing spatial context and so on. 
And I want to briefly demonstrate what this may look like using this example. Um, hopefully we can agree that this might be a tree LA, at least following the definition by green search, it might be tree LA because it's defined there as trees planted along roads or streets or paths um, to form roads. So semantic modeling would involve first and foremost to identify relevant entities to define something. And in our case, it might be tree, street, and we already, we already observed that we might also talk about a row of trees. And now let's define this row of trees because it appears to be crucial. When we want to formalize that using semantic modeling, what we essentially do is to devise properties to describe the traits of this row. So uh, we can reflect on composition. So we devise a property that is called here is composed of, and we can make a statement that a row of tree is composed of tree. And in order to express that these trees are aligned in a row, we can introduce another property to model this trait, which is called here has grouping. And this is a linear group. So it's, some, it's, it's aligned in some sort of linear uh, fashion. So here, linear group would reflect on the grouping of objects, which is a trait. And this would be, or could be a formal definition of a tree alley. And this definition of, uh, sorry, a row of tree, and this definition of row of tree could now be reused in the definition of the tree alley. We can make a statement that the tree alley is composed of row of trees, and these row of trees are adjacent to a street. And this could, this is our notion of tree alley now. And you see by uh, combining different traits, by reflecting on composition, we seek to differentiate and define certain types of U of NDS. And as I've mentioned, um, we've screened several typologies uh, to uh, see if we, for uh, types of green spaces, types of NBS, if we can find certain uh, defining traits from a physical, institutional, or functional dimension. And so step by step, we developed our typology. And this is exemplified here. I hope you can uh, see that on the screen. Essentially, where we started and set out is by the core concept, which is a tree. And what we can do also, and what we did, is to define taxonomical relationships here. We can say that a tree is a type of woody vegetation, which is in turn a type of vegetation, and we consider this type of vegetation, a green landscape element. So relationship can also be expressed through taxonomy. In the next step, we model different traits. This could be that, for example, we say that types of vegetation may contribute to certain processes or may, may have functions, uh, carry out functions such as transpiration or photosynthesis or shading. And in the next step, we can subsequently uh, make a statement or we, we can infer that um, vegetation that contributes to transpiration or shading provides us with the ecosystem service regulation of air temperature and humidity. Or similarly, uh, photosynthesis contributes or provides us with service of carbon storage and sequestration. So we can model different functional traits. I've already exemplified the use of object grouping as a trait to derive types. So uh, here you find our row of trees. When they are in a clustered group, so not forming a row, but cover an area, we get a group of trees. 
And similarly, we can talk about single trees when we deal with solitary trees. And by combining traits, we can now infer or define other types. For example, when we have a single tree that has a very high aesthetical value, we may refer to this as an ornamental tree. And when this ornamental tree now is standing just into road, we might have an ornamental street tree. So through the combination of traits, we get to different types of, in this case, green landscape elements. And we've also included, but uh, more briefly, shrub or grass as green landscape elements. So why do we define these green landscape elements? We consider them to be building blocks. You can find our green landscape elements here. And similarly, we have uh, defined some blue landscape elements, such as uh, body of standing water or rivers, streams. And we have gray landscape elements, so build up elements. And they all make up what we call landscape elements. And we consider these landscape elements or building blocks of the landscape to reflect on the composition of things. And when we piece them together, for example, we combine a green landscape elements such as uh, a grove, a group of trees with a street or with a pond, what we ultimately get is some sort of green-blue infrastructure element. We consider these green-blue infrastructure elements all the entities that are composed of at least one green landscape element and or a blue landscape element. However, they may also contain some gray landscape elements. And in so doing, what we do here is conceptualize a notion of a spatial entity because green blue infrastructure elements cover a part of the landscape, so to say. And so by piecing these elements together, we reflect on the composition of youth NBS, we puzzle them together and we can build a forest, so to say. In order to do that, we needed to define, well, a forest in terms of a forest stand. And this uh, proved to be actually not too easy. Um, we found a general definition that a forest can be understood as an area dominated by trees. Now that's not necessarily helpful because we need to reflect further on this, um, what's an area dominated by trees. And we found a reference proposal by Janssen and Rosso that state that what they call a tree dominated area, a treed area, is an area with a canopy cover of at least 50%. And now this is something that we can work with. And what we've did is to first define such a treed area. This is an area that's composed of tree. These trees are grouped in a clustered group, so they cover this area. And the treed area in the end has a canopy cover that's greater than 50%. Now, further on trying to define a forest, we also found that following FAO, a forest is a portion of land bigger than 0.5 hectares. So what we did is we set out from the treat area, we combine it with this size threshold, and we come to our definition of forest. A forest is a treat area that is greater than 5,000 square meters in size. And now that we know what is a forest, we can um, also observe, for example, spatial contexts. And we could, for example, derive types such as riparian forests if we find this forest stand adjacent to a stream or river, for example. So in what we did here for forest, uh, we tried to do that for other types of youth NBS, or well, in this case, as GBI that might be youth NBS. We uh, try to define elements of the urban food forest orchard. We include nurseries and food plantation, uh, forest plantations. We define several types of urban green areas, such as riverbank green, urban park, botanical and historical gardens, allotment and community gardens, and neighborhood green spaces. Um, we try to define types that are associated with urban networks, such as the green verge I've shown previously, margins or railroad banks, there's three trees and three alleys. We included cemeteries in Arboreta, 
And we also uh, defined several types that are associated with structures, uh, such as green roofs and walls, balconies and atria. So these are all considered different types of green-blue infrastructure elements that could potentially form U of MDS. And the way there to our U of MDS is first, well, we need to uh, establish when do we consider these green-blue infrastructures a nature-based solution first. And here we reflect on the definition of nature-based solution that it's a multifunctional entity that provides a range of ecosystem services. And we conceptualize this by defining nature-based solution as something that provides at least two ecosystem services. If this is sufficient to um, define a range is debatable, but at least we have a threshold that we can work with. And this threshold uh, could even be used to differentiate between successful or failed MBS implementations in the end. This link to ecosystem service to define NBS also helps us to bring in the notion of actions as terms, uh, as types of NBS. Because we understand actions as interventions that ultimately want to provide certain benefits, a range of benefits. That is, they have as intended outcome some delivery of ecosystem services. And through that conceptual link, we can, we can uh, consider them, these actions as NBS. And we can also link them to our spatial entities of GBI, because typically an action is carried out somewhere. You, uh, you have an intervention somewhere. So this is the link to the spatial entity. And we uh, considered at the moment certain groups or we propose certain groups of such actions. The first group implementation action is characterized that these interventions seek to provide additional benefits, so to say, through the implementation of additional U of NBS. You could think about afforestation, for example, or wetland construction, or more generally greening in cities that is the establishment and implementation of new urban green spaces. Then we propose restoration action. These types of actions seek to improve current ecosystem service delivery. That's typically defined as restoring degraded ecosystems. And um, this could be reforestation action or wetland restoration, orchard restoration, but possibly also enrichment planting. And then we suggest a third group of actions, management action. These actions seek to maintain current ecosystem service delivery, or also seek to ensure a long-term delivery of ecosystem services through monitoring actions or through management actions such as watering or tree pruning or pest management and conservation. So now we have established that different types of GBI, but also different types of actions may be considered nature-based solutions. And in order to get from here to our urban forests nature-based solutions, we just make this last conceptual link. And this is not so hard now, because um, we already know what an urban forest is. That's the entirety of trees. So what we can define is urban forests, anything that is a tree, or is composed of a tree, or is composed of something that in turn is itself composed of a tree. And whenever we have an instance that is both urban forest and a nature-based solution, we have a formal definition of urban forest as nature-based solution. And this includes actions as well when they target something that is part of the urban forest. So formally, we define it as the intersection of NBS and urban forest. So method methodologically, 
Um, these were the key aspects in designing the typology. And I don't want to spare you some technical details. Um, technically, as a takeaway, when we talk about ontologies, then we need to make the statement that each ontology is implemented in a formal language. And in our case, we are using what is called the web ontology language. It has this fancy acronym OWL. This is some sort of XML syntax, if you, if you, uh, I guess you know XML. So um, sometimes XML is really hard to read. And therefore what we use is a tool that actually um, enables us to express knowledge through what is called a controlled natural language. And what this looks like, so what our typology in the end looks like is shown here on um, the top left. It's a series of statements of facts and this controlled natural language. This is um, basically very brief sentences in a very specific syntax using a specific vocabulary. And the taxonomy that I've shown previously is expressed here. As an example, every tree is a woody vegetation. Every woody vegetation is a type of vegetation. And every type of vegetation is a green landscape element. So it's these brief sentences that make up our ontology in the end. And because this is very formal and because it's, uh, well, standardized, the advantage is that here we have a product that is machine readable. What this means is it is understood by very software tools so you can reuse this knowledge in software components. That could, for instance, be querying of knowledge to ask questions, what type of U of NBS may provide a certain function or if we implement this knowledge, what U of NBS proved to be successful for a certain challenge, for example. We can use this knowledge for inference and reasoning, it's really reusable and extendable. So we can include additional bodies of knowledge and data sets or models. And in fact, we also um, included various traits, for example, for trees, such as uh, species or height, trunk circumference, trunk area, and so on, uh, to possibly establish linkages to databases or models later on that facilitate the assessment of impacts or services provided. Also, just as a brief example, what it means to use this in software is demonstrated um, here. Sorry, um, next slide. Um, we can load this into a software tool that documents our typology. And that might look like that. And this is possibly a bit different to uh, other typologies, because here you can um, interactively browse the knowledge, you can uh, interactively explore the different relationships, and you can um, go to classes to uh, see the meaning uh, for whatever I'm going to greenverge. So um, you can uh, browse the formal definition that we use, and what we've also included is some sort of textual definition, for example. And we could even include pictures here. So an interactive documentation, which might be one way to disseminate our uh, typology, and which may be one way, uh, or which may be relevant maybe for discussion in Group B. Is this useful? Is the question that I'd be really interested in. So uh, to conclude, and maybe some brief points for discussion. Um, I try to show you that what we wanted to do is to reflect on composition and traits. So we follow the traits-based approach. And to get to our U of NBS, what we did is to start out with the basic entities, the core entity being tree, set out from there and try to see which elements of the landscape can be puzzled together to derive certain types of U of NBS. And we did the same for actions. In this case, we used several activities that might describe certain actions. What we also did is to uh, make linkages to the overarching concept, simply because, well, you remember the green word example. Um, it depends on composition, whether something is in U of NBS or not. 
And certainly it might also depend on the ecosystem services provided in the end, if something is a successful MBS or not. One thing that, um, well, needs to be kept in mind is that, well, this is the first iteration. And uh, when you've seen the types included so far, you might have thought, oh, well, it's not so many. And especially in regard to certain sub taxonomies, such as urban green spaces, uh, we have less types when we compare that with other typologies. Uh, there, you usually see a lot of types such as pocket park or town park, precinct park, or medium or large urban parks. And we could not really yet define these types. On the one hand, because we could not find distinctive traits in terms of size, for example, thresholds to use to differentiate between these. And also when we reflect on composition, we couldn't really find a difference. So certain elements might not be expressible in our approach when compared to others. Uh, in order to include more types, therefore, we need to review our traits. We need to review how we conceptualize in composition, for example, certain U of MBS. And uh, here, it's really helpful that semantic modeling and ontology building is an iterative process. So uh, we really hope to bring this forward to, we'll say, a version two. And uh, this is something uh, to be discussed, for example, in uh, session A. And possibly also for session B. Um, I've shown you uh, the technical side, and the technical side is often considered a barrier, possibly. But there are many interesting opportunities for reuse. I've shown you how you can plug this into a software tool that makes the documentation and uh, it, uh, this interactive documentation. Uh, similarly, we can use this to build software tools, for example, um, to make U of NBS inventories. We can try to plug this into classification or assessment tools or knowledge-based applications. So it might prove, uh, it might be the basis for the implementation of decision support. And um, so there are many opportunities here and we are really interested to see um, what you might envision what we could do with that. And that was my brief primer and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sebastian. This was very, uh, very broad and, uh, <laughs> and full of interesting information. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, congratulations on the huge work to you and the, the team that has been working on it for the past uh, year and more. Um, so yes, let's open to to a little Q and A session. We have about five ten minutes, and I do not see any questions yet in the chat. Uh, well, now I see somebody's writing. Shelly, you have two questions. So question from Chadi. Your first question is uh, regarding the tree area as we consider the tree canopy. How about new afforestation sites? Those new planted trees usually have a low tree canopy that is uh, less than 50%. Uh, I hope I'm, I'm phrasing, formulating correctly the, um, the question of Chadi. <laughs> yeah, I've seen it in the chat as well. Uh, it's actually quite interesting. Um, and there are several approaches that we take. On the one hand, if um, we have a canopy cover that's already less, I mean, we might, we might say that's, well, not yet what we call a treat area, but something that will develop into one. So it might be an intermediate state that we can depict. On the other hand, um, what is certainly doable and what we've sort of foreseen is that, oh, well, when, when, when I was talking about a tree, I was talking quite in, in quite abstract terms. However, usually you would know what sort of trees planted. So by considering um, such species characteristics, um, we, we might be able to determine that this is going to become a tree area because of the trees that's going to be planted. So we have at, mature, at maturity a certain um, leaf area, crown volume and so on. So from the properties of the tree, we might also be able to derive that this will become one. So uh, I mean, it's certainly there's different possibilities how we can approach such, such uh, 
intermediate states, for example, following an action. And in regard to the second question, if I may just pick up that one immediately, um, can I say the function link, the social attribute? Yes, your question is, can we, uh, as we also consider the function of trees, can I say the function link, the social attributes of trees, such, such as the orchids, cultural heritage trees? Um, if I understand that correctly, I, I, I would say, yes, uh, function might also reflect on social attributes, if this was the question. So um, we, we define function broadly as uh, touching up on ecosystem services and or, or not, not necessarily only ecosystem services, but ultimately in the end, function provides us with ecosystem services. And surely we uh, can reflect up in cultural ecosystem services and we may broaden this, uh, like for example, aesthetical value and, or heritage value. And we could also broaden this perspective to, to include certain uh, social attributes, I would say. Thanks a lot. There is also a question on whether we can get the PDF of this presentation or the link. Uh, I think we can provide the presentation in the end, sure. And also in regard to the product, the examples I've shown, there's also PDF available on the Clearinghouse website, if I'm not mistaken. Thanks a lot. I do not see any other questions so far in the chat, but if you have any, feel free. Um, you can even, we, we still have five minutes, so you can even ask them briefly uh, by turning on your mic if you'd like. Uh, so Deborah Sue from Fiji Forestry is mentioning that they're just starting to develop urban forestry and would very much appreciate the recording. Yes, there will be, this session has been uh, recorded and it will be shared uh, afterwards. Sebastian, you confirm? Um, I, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> just depends where we put it on the website, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Is there any other question before we give you uh, the indications of what's coming up next and we'll have a little break? Okay, there's a question from Anton Kuneke. Did you standardize the concept of what a tree is? Sorry again, I, I, I don't see the question in the chat. It's uh, uh, The question is, did you standardize the concept of what a tree is? Um, it's an interesting question. I would say, no, not really. Um, I mean, here we dive into, uh, well, uh, other bodies of knowledge, I, I would argue. We, we are picking up, say, the notion of tree that stands for itself. We, we don't define, I mean, we define a tree through traits such as uh, species or height or trunk circumference. But what we don't do is to define the tree. So we don't, in this regard, standardize it. However, uh, there are other typologies, there uh, or well, other ontologies that try to attempt exactly that. There is an ontology on uh, ecological concepts, and uh, there is also one uh, that's that has been developed at uh, NASA actually, um, that that seeks to uh, even. Uh, define measurements or units and the like. And what we could do is to provide from our tree concept, that's a bit abstract, to other typologies or other ontologies that, that seek to define a concept further. So we could establish these linkages and by so doing, we would get a more standardized notion of what exactly is a tree. Uh, but here um, we were more referring to these terms as abstract terms from the literature that 
what 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 is typically defined as tree as a type of woody vegetation and a shrub is another type of woody vegetation, but we don't define what is a tree and what is shrub. No. Thanks a lot. Is there a final question from our large audience? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks uh, also, Rick, for for sharing the the link um, to the research uh, paper of uh, Clearing House. Um, well, if there's no no extra question, uh, if you have a last minute one, feel free to add it. I'm just going to introduce uh, what's happening next. Uh, we're going to have a little break at 9.30 for, for 15 minutes, so you can grab some coffee and, uh, and uh, absorb everything that has been said, <laughs> which was so insightful. Um, after the break, we're going to be doing, we're going to go into two breakout sessions, session A and session B. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit more about this, and um, you will get the chance to choose what session you want to join. And so the aim is that uh, after after we move to the break, you, you you go into your session in the room of your session on Zoom. You'll see on Zoom you've got the option to to choose, and we'll meet there at 9:45 in your rooms. Uh, the aim is that we have at least 10 people per session. So in case there is too many in one or the other, we, we might have to redistribute a little bit. So session A, uh, which will be with Sebastian, is uh, intended to discuss the typology that he just presented. So regarding its uh, content and methodology. Uh, the the topic for the session ranges from the the discussion on the on the traits that are used to conceptualize the UFNBS that were that were presented, uh, identification of gaps, shortcomings, and and vision on how to linkage uh, the typology with other knowledge and data. So it's really regarding content. And session B is going to be more um, relation uh, relation based session to see how this uh, typology. Uh, can be, and, and the proposed ontology can be connected with other projects and initiatives. So broadening and seeing what are all the linkages that can be done. And also with the objective in this session B to, to find ways for successful dissemination of the findings. Um, so session A, as I mentioned, uh, will be uh, facilitated by um, Sebastian. I will be present as a co-facilitator. And session B will be facilitated by Manuel Wolf uh, that I mentioned before, and so and it will be co-facilitated by Lamia Viaz, uh, who works with me at LGI. A few words about Manuel and Lamia. Um, Manuel is a postdoctoral researcher at the Landscape uh, Ecology Lab, also at Humboldt uh, University to Berlin. His expertise and research include sustainable urban development, resource efficiency, socio-environmental justice, and the development of indicator-based conceptual approaches and GIS models for the analysis of human environmental interactions and trends in European cities. And Lamia Bias, she works at LGI as a sustainable innovation consultant and project holder. Uh, she holds an MBA at INSEAD and she supports partners and European projects um, in, in tasks related to the market introduction of their innovations, including uh, on the topics of the nature-based solutions. So this is a the little small introduction. I suggest now, um, I don't know how this will work, Rick, if there will be a pop-up for everybody to choose their group uh, coming up on Zoom. So now you can make it, you will be able to make a choice between session A and session B, and uh, you can already connect in the session. That way we know who's going to which session. And we'll start the, the sessions at, um, at 9.45. Uh, we will then have a small break at the end of the session and regroup for closing uh, from 11 to 11.15 so that we can share the findings of the, the two sessions. Yes, um, I will maybe a bit, well, around 9, uh, 9.40 I will open the two rooms. Um, so there's, I will rename the rooms according to the names we have here or in the previous slide and then you just select the room where you want to participate. 
Okay, not not possible to already open it uh, now so that we can have a view of who's going in which group and redistribute if needed. Uh, that's also possible. Uh, okay. Thanks a lot. You maybe need a couple minutes to be able I need, to uh, launch. Two, yeah. Two minutes, yes. <laughs> okay. Great. Yes. Okay. Well, within two minutes, you'll be able to choose your group, and and we invite you to to go directly in the breakout room. That way, we see who's where, and uh, we'll start the sessions at nine forty-five. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. I did forget something to mention that we will be using an online tool called Mural. I just see Sebastian already posted the link. So feel free to already connect on that link and we'll explain everything in the breakout sessions. And uh, when you connect, you can just, uh, you don't need to identify. You, if you wish, you can add your name, but you don't need to create an account. You can just uh, join, the, um, join the Mural whiteboard. Thank you. Eventually, uh, Sebastian and Emmanuel, would you like to to do a summary in a few minutes for each of your groups. Yeah, I, I hope you can see the screen being shared again, the mural. Yes. OK, great. So um, it took us a while in group A um, to get started with the uh, in-depth discussion simply because of having to look at this for the first time. But then in the end, I think we got some really uh, nice insights and comments and feedback. As for example, um, what we were still a bit lacking in is um, uh, protective benefits of trees or urban forests as nature-based solutions. Uh, for example, um, against uh, winds or storm or flooding. And also uh, benefits uh, for restoration such as soil restoration uh, should be depicted. Um, we've got comments that um, religious or spiritual values um, should be depicted. We've had a nice input um, when it comes to uh, defining urban or suburban or peri-urban forests. Um, that uh, here we are not only talking about administrative areas or um, characteristics of these spatial units, but also that uh, we have a different uh, value uh, to, uh, for example, biodiversity. So when we link this uh, to restoration, for example. Um, um, what uh, we also discussed is um, a bit on these elements, whether they are inclusive or exclusive, um, for instance, to also consider then protected areas and how could we depict this or uh, maintenance. And it was quite a nice discussion. And um, in the end, uh, we've also got some uh, comments um, that uh, in the that overall it was uh, comprehensive, but not possibly not really lacking too many types. <laughs> uh, insightful is quite nice to hear that. And we hope to uh, further this with the comments to revise this. Um, unanswered is a bit here, um, how far we want to go with this. For example, integrating additional ES, as also ecosystem services. Um, but uh, we, could, we could ask this obviously <laughs> for the whole, we can always dig deeper. Um, so this is something that we possibly also need to um, uh, make ourselves clear first. Uh, and then ideas, what could be done is um, how can we use this or if this could be used beyond the scope of NBS. Uh, my gut feeling says uh, certainly, but we need to see how or what for. Maybe this is also something that Group B will give us some insight now. And uh, what is also a comment here, what you could try to see is uh, whether we estimate costs of actions, although this may vary widely by country or region, but something to possibly look into and certainly uh, something for Clearinghouse to investigate. Manuel? Thanks a lot. Up to you, Manuel. <laughs> Thanks. Um, also, um, I'm afraid I cannot share my screen, um, but maybe we, we stay here with Sebastian. Um, 
Sebastian, may I ask you to go to go down to um, exactly to the upper um, one yeah region? I mean, if it's easier, I can unshare my screen and you share yours. No, but I don't have the function to see here. Okay, whatever. So uh, starting top left. <clears throat> no, at the bottom, please. Yes, this one. So um, we're basically. So I will. I will structure this summary around three major points uh, we came up. Um, the first one we discussed is to what extent can the topology also be used for, for planning purpose, for local authorities. And here, of course, the first impression is that the um, topology as it is, at the moment, it's convincing on the one hand, um, but also very technical on the others and may not be directly be used by local authorities. Um, however, what can be done is to uh, to rearrange it and um, a bit um, and to connect it a bit with terms um, people are more familiar with. Uh, for instance, um, the sponge city, resilient city, have a look on uh, what are actually traits of those cities and how it can be connected to the topology. And the other idea is, of course, to um, from not just the technical advantage, but also the advantage of this uh, ontology, the relation between the different elements, uh, to turn this benefit a bit more out or to bring it to the front, because this could be really an added value for any um, advanced um, um, green space planning in cities. Um, yeah, so this is the first, uh, the first part. If you could go to, um, to the right um, a bit up. And here we are talking a bit on how to connect it to other uh, knowledge hubs. Um, and here we haven't so much focus on other projects out of the scope of Clearinghouse. But um, as you just said, um, Sebastian, it's it's also so we came also up with the idea it could be linked with um, also environmental economists. So the, the monetary interest is also present here. And of course, this is the, um, the criteria, which is also relevant maybe for planners. Um, we all also talked um, about um, an application. May it be in GIS, um, in a GIS exercise, for instance, to a local specific case, which could raise more attention among certain audiences, for instance. And at the later stage, this is currently out of the bull's eyes because this is something which is slowly evolving, but will uh, will have some some impact, um, maybe even um, outside of the project's live meeting a bit up, um, Sebastian, is um, when it is connected to any kind of educational um, programs, for instance, master's students dissertation, but also to bring it to any kind of learning uh, laboratories and living um, laboratories, uh, for instance. Um, because this could raise new potential for, for instance, new funding also in the longer term and gives um, even the typology a bit more of a lifespan, so to say. So this is this, uh, the second one, second major point. And the third one, which is, uh, which is here, is all the different channels and uh, organization and events um, where this typology might be of interest. And they go from, from the outside to the, to the inside. Um, in the next year, we do have a couple of events. Um, two of them might be very relevant, uh, the one in Belgrade and the online um, event for the EU Green Work, where this typology can be can be of interest. Um, a bit more in, in the short run, this is the, the inner circle here, is the idea to, um, to um, use the upcoming webinar, and I'm sure there there will be something said more um, at the end of, of today's workshop. There's a webinar in November where the presentation or where the typology will again be pre um, presented. And this webinar will be recorded. And using the recording of this presentation of the typology can further be used, um, for instance, on um, to put on, on channels like YouTube, but also on Chinese um, um, channels. Um, and could further by doing this could also be linked to um, IOCN platforms here in Europe and also in, in China. And this could be um, a very feasible idea of dissemination um, even until the end of the year. Yeah, this is um, basically it. These are the three points. So maybe if I miss some, uh, there are some other ideas, um, um, some minor ideas, but this is basically the short summar summary of this. Thanks a lot, Manuel. And 
well, we if you have any any last remark or um, or reaction, anything you'd like to add uh, to your group or to to ask to the other group, uh, now is the time before we wrap up and finish uh, in five minutes with Rick. Can I just add a point, Joanne, please? This is Clyde. Yeah. Um, uh, with respect to the educational uh, aspect of it, we thought, well, I, it, it was a comment I made, was that there may be some potential to apply for additional funding related to Erasmus+. Plus. Um, uh, and secondly, um, and I guess this is from my own experience working in a, a school that is at a, a university school that's training planners, is that actually one of the way one of the advantages of this is to actually teach people about semantics and uh, ontology, um, and but in in so doing to be able to also you know inculcate people through this particular application. Um, into what urban forestry and nature-based solutions actually is. So it could have educational spin-offs to quite a large audience potentially and be funded. So, you know, I think that's something that's really worth thinking about for the future. But I think it's probably outside of the scope of Clearinghouse itself to run with that idea. Hmm. Well, thank, thanks a lot. Uh, I don't see any other comments. I just wanted to mark mark this moment with a little celebration <laughs> for all your <laughs> contribution to, to the workshop. Uh, thanks a lot. And maybe Rick, I'd let you close with a few last words. Thank you, Joanne. <clears throat> um, yes, thank you all for your intense and active contribution. Um, I think this was very interesting and important to see your comments, particularly from the people from outside to the Clearinghouse um, group. I've been jumping from one breakout group to the others and uh, seeing comments from, from quite some people outside our own project. So that's, that's uh, always interesting. Um, so I'm sure that Sebastian has a lot of food for further work and further thought, and we even have ideas for new projects. So that's always always uh, good. Um, so um, with this, I would, would like to thank you all, um, well, Sebastian, Manuel, Dagmar, for, first of all, for setting this typology uh, up, uh, creating this typology. Um, Lamia and Joanne and all the colleagues at LGI for uh, assisting in organizing the workshop and in uh, facilitating the workshop. And uh, all of you of, for participating in, indeed, um, this very nice overview of all the social medias, uh, social media that we have uh, where you can follow Clearinghouse is a very good, uh, good anchor point to keep on uh, following us in the next two years that the projects will still be running. Um, well, of course, talking about further events, uh, Clive is reminding me on the, the webinar uh, on the, I think it's on the 17th of November, if I'm, or the 18th of November, um, where we will uh, be presenting uh, the work of the first, first year of uh, in Clearinghouse. Uh, indeed, it's the 17th of November. Keep an eye on this through uh, our social media when we will be opening the registrations for this. Um, well, th I think this is the main uh, upcoming event. Um, for, uh, next, I also would like to, uh, to, to remind you on visiting the website and have an eye on the inspirational package for education, which is, uh, uh, which is termed cities, City of Trees. Um, which is also getting lots of attention by the European Commission uh, these days. And uh, finally, uh, we will, of course, send you the presentations and the video of this, uh, of this morning or this afternoon for you in China. Um, and also a very short survey to, to have your feedback on how we have organized this uh, this uh, this event. Um, so Joanne is uh, pasting the links to, do, to some social media in the chat, so you can 
uh, follow us uh, immediately if you like. Um, so with this, I would like uh, to, uh, to close the event. We are sharply and exactly on time. Um, thank you all in China for uh, joining during uh, a, a national holiday. And thank you all in Europe for uh, joining in this, uh, this period of, of, and I see a high number of events. So I also appreciate your time that you have spent in, uh, with us this morning. And we hope to see you uh, soon, uh, for instance, on the 17th of November. Thank you all. Um, Joanne, I think, uh, yes. I don't know if you want to say the final words. <laughs> Thanks, uh, <well>. Yes. <laughs> You've said it all. Thank you yes. very much to uh, all the organizers, organizers and, uh, and for the active participation of uh, all of you in the very fruitful sessions. We'll be in touch. <laughs> Thank you. And Goodbye. have a nice uh, rest of the day or evening. Thank yeah. you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.